morning. Um, I'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's hearings of uh, August 7th, 2024. We have three hospitals presenting their budgets for fiscal year 25. Southwestern Vermont Medical Center, Copley Hospital, and Rutland Regional Medical Center. Um, before we start, we'll have remarks from the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems, and also from the Vermont Healthcare Advocate. And with that, I'll turn it to Mr. Del Treco from the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems for his opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Chair Foster. Good morning, everyone, um, board members and members of the public. First, I want to start by thanking uh, the board, Elena and her team for the work leading up to these presentations and members of the public for being here today. And on behalf of all Vermont's not-for-profit hospitals, thank you for allowing me to comment on these 2025 budgets. Before I get into my comments, I think it's also important to acknowledge and thank every single hospital employee across the state that helps get the job done every day. I want them to know from me and my team at VAS how important they are to Vermont and their communities. As we are all deeply familiar, our hospitals have been under great pressure over the last few years and intensely understand the pressures facing Vermonters and the healthcare delivery systems. We know that access challenges Vermonters are facing to get in to see their primary care doctor or get a specialty per appointment are concerning. The lack of mental health, long-term care and substance use services, to name a few, impact the health of Vermonters every day. The affordability pressures from high insurance premiums, co-pays and deductibles, and rising hospital costs impact choice. The sweeping financial challenges that both hospitals and insurers are managing are real. Unfortunately, there are no quick answers or solutions. But as we examine hospital budgets, we must continue to understand the impact that Vermont's landscape and demographics have on our circumstances. We are old, we are rural, and we are small. All of these things impact our economies of scale. We have increasing utilization and acuity of care needs, housing pressures, and flat economic growth. These all go into the compact, complex healthcare equation. Even with these challenges, I am pleased to say that hospitals have submitted responsible and carefully crafted budgets centering on patient care needs with critical investments in staff, facilities, and equipment, while also recognizing cost pressures Vermonters are facing. Very importantly, these budgets have been submitted represent significant progress towards stabilization and demonstrate a clear and strong message to our communities that hospitals have leaned in on the issue of affordability. Overall, the system rate increase ranges from 2.2% to 10.5%, with a weighted average of approximately 6.4%. This is down 40% from 2024 approved amount, amounts and in line with stubborn inflationary pressures. It's important to remember when reviewing these budgets that they're about people. We are 24 seven, 365 day a year operation that require highly skilled workforce. In fact, 60% of our budgets go to support these amazing teams. The submitted operating margin of 2.3% is a move towards stabilization However, we know these margins need to be higher so we can appropriately invest in systematic change while caring for our communities. Even with these pressures, Vermont continues to rank in the top five states in the Independent Commonwealth Report that measures many dimensions of healthcare such as quality, access, and equity. And although we are deeply challenged with affordability issues, Vermont has one of the highest insured rates of 96 plus percentage points. These budgets are about moving forward. As we, as we do, we will focus and continue to work on the positive and stabilizing tra trajectory. We, we are continuing to and committed to examining opportunities to do better. More importantly, we are dedicated to a transparent stakeholder engagement 
working with you and the Green Mountain Care Board staff, AHS, and others. If there are opportunities to do better, we should understand the details, the benefits, the possible unintended consequences, as well as the necessary and best ways to move forward. At the same time, we have to account for external budget pressures that in many instances can be beyond our control. Once again, to address these issues, we require ongoing partnership opportunities to work together to help limit the impacts on future budgets while improving system outcomes. We must work to improve the greater healthcare ecosystem. VAS applauds AHS and their initiatives to increase access to long-term care and mental health. And so this is an important step forward, but again, there's more work to do here. We must improve housing and transportation. These two factors alone threaten every aspect of healthy communities. They make recruiting workforce challenging and they tamp down economic growth opportunities. We must improve the financial policy positions such as dish funding, provider tax, and cost shift issues to be more specific. DISH, Vermont does not take advantage of federal disproportionate share payments that they could. Our federal funding cap is $47 million, yet annually we use about 22 million. From fiscal year 23 to 24, we have a lost revenue opportunity of $144 million. We need to maximize federal funding. This would both help, help hospitals and create relief on commercial insurance. Provider tax spending. Vermont's 6% pro provider tax equals approximately $200 million on hospitals. That, along with federal matching dollars, cover 100% of hospital me Medicaid reimbursement and provide other funding opportunities for state investments. A review of the provider tax should take place to determine if there is the ability to increase Medicaid rates, to put downward pressure on the cost shift, and improve access to services. Cost shift. The annual Green Mountain Care Report on the cost shift identifies that in 2023, the Medicaid and Medicare underfunding totaled $582 million. This is a significant financial burden both on providers and insurers. As we explore new state and federal payment models, it's imperative that this be addressed. Vermont can no longer afford to do business this way. And finally, I want to circle back to where I started. Although I'm cautiously optimistic that, we're, that we are making forward progress and are in a better place today since any point from the pandemic, we do know that the road ahead is very challenging and the simple fact there's a lot more work to do. I know that my members and I am committed to doing the work and I ask the board to support these budgets so our hospitals continue their efforts to stabilize and meet their community needs. We need critical resources so we can get this work done on the road ahead. I really appreciate the time here, Chair Foster, and thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. Um, Mr. Fisher. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Chair Foster and members of the board, uh, I appreciate having a few moments to speak to you uh, as you launch into this next significant phase that is the summer, the annual summer of regulation, uh, hospital budgets. Um, I don't need to spend any time reminding you, you all know the perfect storm we're in. Um, we spent a lot of time recently looking at uh, the impacts of this perfect storm on our insurance carriers. Um, we are about to spend a decent amount of time, a, a lot of time, looking at how this perfect storm is affecting um, our hospitals. And I know you know how this storm is affecting Vermonters, the consumer affordability challenges. Um, so this is hard. This is going to be hard. I just want to just pause and recognize that. I also, I should also pause and um, I want to echo what Mike Del Treco just said about recognizing and appreciating not only the hospital leaderships that will come before you over the next couple of weeks, 
uh, but also the people on the front line providing care. Um, uh, super important. It's what we're all here for, after all. Um, you've heard me over previous years talk about the ratio of bad debt to free care. And I'm going to do it a little bit again. Um, uh, the last year for which we have full data, 2023, uh, the range of how hospitals are doing in that ratio goes from one to one, uh, that's UVM, uh, for every dollar of free care they gave out, they uh, um, one dollar of bad debt or medical debt went to people who got care. Um, to a low on the other side of seven to one or one to seven for every dollar of free care, uh, a little over $7, seven dollars, seven dollars and 22 cents um, went to medical debt it's for people in their community, for people they served. Um, I'm not going to name that hospital. Um, so I have over the years asked this question and I continue to ask it, what is it that leads to that variation? Um, the most obvious uh, answer to that is um, a, a difference in the relative generosity of those two hospitals. Um, that's what we're seeking to address with Act 119. Uh, you, you heard a presentation about Act 119 a number of months ago from members of my team. It went into effect on July 1st, and it seeks to normalize for it. It creates a, a statewide, minimum, um, statewide minimum for free care policies um, in an attempt to uh, find a balance, find a, find a way to apply a, um, a system across the state. Um, so briefly, um, Act 119, uh, the effort to help hospitals comply with Act 119 has been a, a major effort of the HCA over the last year. Um, we're really trying to support hospitals in providing the community benefit that, uh, that they need to provide to their, their communities. And on a high level, good job. Hospitals have done um, a, a good job across the system in complying with the law and, um, you know, um, and in not stepping back from their uh, effort to uh, provide real benefit to their communities. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't some weak points. Um, there are quite a few hospitals that have uh, had a challenge in uh, complying, and, um, and we will uh, spend some time hospital by hospital recognizing some of those challenges and, and, and successes uh, as hospitals come before you. We're going to stay on it. We are staying on a relatively high level this year. The law is complex. There's many, many pieces to it. We're not going into the depths of it. We're staying on a high level of, um, uh, you know, have hospitals satisfied the plain language summary requirements? How are they measuring income and uh, verifying income for people in their community who are seeking free care, um, asset test compliance and residency, and those kinds of things. Um, so, um, I'm now shifting back over to um, <laughs> the process in front of you. Uh, I, you know, we recognize in looking at the submissions this year, that some hospitals have demonstrated a real ability to cut costs um, by reducing administration, collaborating with other hospitals, partnering with community organizations um, to meet their community's needs. And, and we, we want to recognize that and we'll recognize that um, as hospitals come before you. Um, We also recognize uh, and understand the board's interest in looking at a lot of details about the hospitals in front of you, uh, hospital quality, provider pro productivity. I understand and support the effort to gain a better understanding of what is going on in our hospital system. But I also think it's important to say here that 
We think it's important to remain focused on what you can do um, and uh, to really to address, as I said, the storm in front of us, and that is hospital prices and hospital costs. The HCA doesn't arrive at these hearings with an NPR or commercial rate recommendation for any hospital, and I don't think the board should either. It's, you know, we certainly support hospitals uh, rights or uh, the importance of them coming before you to make their case. Um, we can certainly see circumstances where uh, that would lead us to recommend or support a hospital receive uh, an NPR that exceeds the guidance. We can also see circumstances where we think it would be right for the board to decide to reduce a hospital's commercial rate even below the cap in the guidance. We can see scenarios where it would be reasonable for the board to deny a hospital's commercial rate if there is insufficient evidence uh, in the record to support it. Overall, um, the effort in front of us as we understand it is, um, is to address uh, the perfect storm and to do what you can to uh, limit the tremendous rate of growth of spending. That's the task in front of us. And the HCA remains committed to supporting you in that effort and um, and making recommendations in, in line with that. And um, we look forward to many hours of meeting with you over the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Fisher. Um, I think with that, we can turn to uh, Southwestern Vermont. Um, Mr. D, the witnesses are Dr. Dobson, Mr. Uh, Laba, and yourself. That's correct. And I'm sorry, is it Laba or Laba? How do you pronounce your last name? It is Laba. Mm -hmm. Laba, great. All right. Uh, if you could please uh, raise your right hand and I'll swear the witnesses in. Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Um, and just for the court reporter, we need verbal answers. Yep. Yeah. I, I got I Mr. D. I, mm -hmm. I didn't get uh, Mr. Laba and Dobson. I do. I do. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, um, and thank you for being here. Uh, we appreciate it, and it's nice to see you all again. Um, Mr. D, I'll turn it to you. Okay. Well, good morning, Chairman Foster. Thank you, and it's good to see you. And we also um, thank the board members, Holmes, Lunge, Merman, and Walsh for your 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 time this morning and time through this entire process. I know it's a, it's a major undertaking. Also, want to thank um, Mike Del Treco and Mike Fisher for their for their comments, which are greatly appreciated. And uh, we appreciate the opportunity um, this morning to present our 2025 budgets. You know, as as certainly um, Mike Fisher outlined and, and Mike Del Treco, these are extremely challenging times in healthcare, and um, and SVMC is continuing um, its transition in our health um, system operation, especially as um, a new member of the Dartmouth Health System. Um, you know, certainly, you know, we are faced with many challenges and risks in our in our budget, um, and we also um, will highlight some what we think is some opportunities in our budget as we continue to transform ourselves um, to a more finan a more stable financial base. And, and and certainly, our last three years have been a challenge after the, the fact that we went through a, a period of 12 years of relatively very consistent financial performance. Um, but we're continuing to focus on community need, and we're focusing on, on on initiating services that you hear about today that increase access to care uh, for the underserved. Uh, we are trying to put a major institutional focus on primary care and also the needs of women and children. And we're also migrating into mental health services. So these are all things which we think in our community, they're very significant uh, needs. So, so with that as a, a brief intro, let me just run through some 
just some some additional background information. Next slide, Bob. Again, our, our presenters today, my, myself and, and Bob Laba, and, and Bob will introduce himself when he comes up, but he's our new chief financial officer, he came to us by way of um, the North, upstate New York area. Been here for a little less than a year, and this is his first um, his first um, rodeo going through the, uh, the, the Green Mountain Care Board budget process. Um, you all know Dr. Trey Dobson, who's been a, a mainstay for a hospital for a long period of time, and, 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 and Jim Roy, who's also um, familiar to our controller. Next slide. So by way of background, um, this is just an optic in terms of giving you a sense of our health system, um, which um, really co it covers three states. So um, um, what, what I think noteworthy here is that our our volume of patients now is about 30% of our of our volume comes out of state. And that's a that's an increasing trend. And certainly we're in the southwestern corner where we're we're 12 miles from Massachusetts and about five miles from New York. So we clearly have um, border issues that we deal with every day. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> quick um, profile of our hospital. You know, we're over 100 years old. Uh, we're not the oldest hospital that's been incorporated, but we're, we're probably still the oldest physical plant in the state. We're, we're trying to play a little catch up ball and, and, and do um, infrastructure upgrades. Um, as I indicated, we're serving three states and we have a medical staff of, um, of about 200, 150 or, uh, active staff. You know, it, and it's, it's a tremendous medical staff, all 100% board certified. Uh, we have about 1,200 employees. And, and we, we continue to strive very hard to provide high quality care. And, um, you know, certainly from our, from our CMS star uh, rankings over the last three or four years, consistently a four or a five, you know, our mag, I mean, our nursing service um, clearly is a very strong point for us of a magnet um, designation, five time magnet. And also what's been recent in just in the last month, we've been named um, the Lantern Award winner for nursing, for emergency room nursing care. And that's the first Lantern Award in a uh, hospital in Vermont and New Hampshire and, and also in the capital region of New York. So we're very proud of the level of care that we're providing. Next um, slide. You know, our, our focus is on our strategic plan and you know, what drives us is our board governance structure, working closely with our um, executive team, medical staff and other employees in terms of putting together a, a, a community based plan that that looks at key issues such as our workforce, our operations, our infrastructure and our clinical services. And uh, with a goal right now of continued system integration into a larger system, which we think will help to bring the scale that we need to meet the needs of our community. Next slide. And um, I, I won't go into real detail here because um, it really talks about the, the key areas of our plan. But if you look at the far right chart, it's the, it's what we're really evolving towards is a is a population health model <clears throat> that focuses less and less on fee for service and focuses on the total needs of our community with, um, with value, driving the cost of care down and increasing the outcomes, um, a high level of quality outcomes for our patients. That's our, our vision. Uh, we're on that journey. We're still early on in it, but uh, we think we're making progress and we think with, the, with our involvement with a larger system, we can, we can help to, to reach that uh, vision sooner. Certainly working through one care is an important piece of that also. Next slide, please. And uh, the centerpiece of our longer term strategy is our is our integration into the Dartmouth Health um, system. And um, as I reported last year to you, we are the we are the six hosp six member hospital in um, Dartmouth Health. Um, the seventh one just joined a, a couple of weeks ago in uh, Valley Hospital in New, in New Hampshire. So um, again, as I mentioned earlier, our ability to work together with other institutions, share services, um, share our overhead um, in terms of our operations, and trying to continue to, to drive down administrative costs is one of our one of our goals here. Um, next slide. 
And let me ask um, Trey just a, a comment on this slide because I think it's uh, pretty pretty important from our our strategic direction and with um, our clinical services being a driver here. Yeah, good morning, everyone. So I'm going to try to use some um, real examples here and, and throughout my parts of the presentation, you know, my conversations with uh, community members uh, and patients in our system. So um, let me just start. Let's look at this left side of your slide where it says SPMC is developing into a regional referral hospital, the DH system. And, and I would just add regional referral hospital for this region um, outside of DH within Vermont. Um, you know, a lot of people don't realize this, but if you have even a simple injury, let's say you fall and you have a hip fracture and you go to uh, one of the hospitals in Vermont, maybe a smaller hospital that doesn't happen to have orthopedic services available, um, the transfer and acceptance at another facility is not clear cut. It is almost um, unheard of for it to be a protocolized um, aspect, unless maybe you're within the UVM system and they have something set up. Um, and so what happens is an emergency physician gets on the phone and just tries to find a place that will accept that patient, which is often at a tertiary care center outside of Vermont. And that is um, for, you know, something like a hip fracture, you know, that's just really not best use of resources. But that physician is going to do the best they can to get the patient the care they need now. So SVMC has opened up, you know, it's, it's actually on our website. Um, and we've distributed information, and we're also within the DH Transfer Center to be a place where if we are capable of doing that service, we will accept that patient into our hospital and take care of them. And, you know, it's been great since we started that process. It's been about nine months, um, and we've, you know, had dozens and dozens of patients come in to our system. We can accept, you know, between a third and a half of those who call. Um, the other ones you know, typically do need a service that we don't have. But, um, you know, that's a third of uh, of transfers that would probably go out of state or um, at least be in a higher cost area. Um, and the same is true for, for outpatient services, too. You know, we have dermatology that we're trying to expand. We have some services that aren't offered at, at all facilities. We believe we can enhance those and increase our catchment area from, as you can see on the slide, around 75,000 to 125,000. That's not just a guess, that's actually based on data from a third party uh, who analyzed that. And you may have heard of that because we did that about 18 to 24 months ago, and I believe we presented that data uh, last time. Um, on the right side here, this is an example of some of the services we want to expand. And, and I, I want to caution that this is both outpatient and inpatient. So in oncology, um, we have a robust cancer center. We're looking to expand both the footprint and the staffing. And the reason is, is straightforward. There is demand. There are patients that leave our area for oncology that want to stay here. So another example, I was just at an event the um, other night where I spoke with a local uh, person in government who said she loves our facility. Unfortunately, her husband is being treated at Dana-Farber, and she used the word unfortunately. She likes the service there, but she wanted him treated here, and she couldn't get in. So we have to expand those services. And think about the cost to Vermonters for that person to just um, have to go way outside of the state for their care, something we could provide here. Same is true for inpatient dialysis. I know you've been kept abreast of the efforts to you know, prevent all of these patients from being transferred. Uh, we have an outpatient dialysis unit that's actually one of the um, rare and few uh, hospital-owned dialysis outpatient units. It's actually high quality, high functioning. You don't have the for-profit entity involved, and we believe we can be doing uh, some inpatient dialysis as well. Again, instead of transferring those patients, uh, to a center, uh, often out of state, higher cost. Same is true with cardiovascular. We're um, going to be expanding to have some vascular services here. Right now, a majority of vascular um, patients, and there are a lot of them, travel to Albany for that pr for procedures. Um, many of them are minimally invasive and can be done at SDMC. Of course, we couldn't support a full-time vascular surgeon. Um, or service because there's not that many patients. So this is a perfect collaboration with, uh, with the medical center, Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center, to have physicians come do procedures and see patients in the outpatient rather than having those patients travel elsewhere. By the way, you know, none of these services that we talk about 
are additional services that would that would not happen otherwise. In other words, this is not an increased cost. This is a savings. You know, here's a classic example: a, a gastroenterology patient that needs an ERCP, a term you've probably heard of. It's uh, to remove, you know, gallstones, and they're going to get it anyway. It doesn't matter whether we offer the service. This is not a, this is not an elective type procedure. So they're going to go out of state to get it. If we can expand our services become this regional referral center, offer those services to patients, at least uh, on some part-time, if not full-time basis, it should save, um, should save, you know, first off, it save money, but second, it really saves the patient and, and um, what they go through. Mental health, the same. Um, we are, you know, looking at an inpatient adolescent psychiatric unit uh, to try to help um, defray some of the burden across the state. And surgical services. Let me just give another example. You know, we um, have to send patients away for urologic procedures. Even we have one urologist, but we need we need two. We need to expand the service. We need robotics for urology in order to recruit in. And these patients would get their nephrectomies. Um, you know, whether or not we offer them, typically again, out of state. So we can offer nephrectomies if we can have two uh, urologists, and that's our goal. And we've done it in the past. Um, prevent people from traveling. Let me just uh, say a few other things um, in that regard. I'm going to talk a little bit about primary care, but I'm going to save that for another slide. But just two initiatives, these align, you know, they align with Act 167. They align with uh, the, the primary care um, ahead portion of the ahead model. We're still uh, on task to create a family medicine residency in Bennington, Vermont. It is years away because it is um, quite an effort. It would actually be a Dartmouth-Hitchcock residency um, located at, in Bennington at SVMC. You've got the power of a facility that has over 50 residencies and fellowships, uh, so we don't have to you know, um, create something that we haven't done before, uh, but yet the location will be here at SVMC, and that should definitely um, benefit after a number of years, you know, not only our immediate health service area, but Vermont as a whole in having primary care physicians present. And then another problem that we run into, um, and all facilities do, is as we try to create teams of physicians and advanced practice providers, like nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, um, we, we have to have a place where these brand new advanced practice providers have additional clinical time and additional clinical experience. And right now, that's just not the setup in many locations. They come out of training, um, and then they are thrown in to seeing patients without you know, good support. And what happens is they end up leaving. So we are expanding our internal medicine practice, changing it from internal medicine to adult and pediatrics called primary care, a double the footprint, and that will allow us to bring in new advanced practice providers, match them up with a physician, increase the panel size, and take uh, care of our community. So that's it, Tom. Okay. Just, just brief, can we just go back, Bob, for one second? Um, so on these... Um, services, just to emphasize uh, what Dr. Dobson was saying, the more we can keep Vermonters local here, we are, uh, we are saving um, the health system of Vermont money. And we, and we have looked at this extensively. We've looked at our costs of our operations. We've compared ourselves to virtually every hospital within a 75 mile radius. And when you compare us to the other hospitals in our, in our catchment area, we are the lowest cost provider. And, um, and we have good outcomes. We have very strong quality of care initiatives um, that, that has been recognized. So we, we feel confident that if we can come up with strategies that allow us to care for our patients, we can provide um, the right type of care at the right place and at a, at a cost that's more cost effective. And I'm not saying we're, we're inexpensive because we're not. We need to work hard on that. But we're, I think we're more cost effective than, than the vast majority of, of hospitals in a, in, a, in a far greater region. So I just want to emphasize that. Next slide. And of course, you know, with our, with our integration with Dartmouth Health, we're continuing to focus. And one of the major areas we're focusing on is overall administrative costs. How can we reduce administrative costs and provide and funnel more of our resources into bedside care and clinical services um, that meet community need. And areas of su supply chain, 
uh, areas of um, IT, um, human resources, compliance, risk, uh, financial services, administrative services, patient transport, all things that we are, we have specific initiatives that we're focusing on right now as we speak with Dartmouth Hitchcock of how we can, how we can provide um, as good or sometimes better services at a lower cost. And that's a major focus of ours. Next slide. And then, you know, as we continue, and we, we've been with Dartmouth now for, um, you know, we've been working with them, by the way, I think you may know this for, for over, uh, over a decade as an affiliate member, but now as a member of hospital, it's a, it's a different level of discussion, a different level of commitments and investments and integration, and all with the eye of how we can provide better local services. And this is not about shipping patients up to Lebanon. This is about how we can care for them locally. And that's all what, you know, Dartmouth is, you know, their problem is they're over, you know, they run 100% occupied. So they have capacity issues that are real and they're working hard on trying to fit, fix those. Uh, and part of that is us, is there's many Vermonters in their beds that don't need to be in an academic medical center for their care. They need a, a strong community hospital. And that's the role we think we can feel and and that's where we're working closely on. So it's keeping patients local and reducing out migration, and then looking for opportunities to um, to interconnect. And one of the keys is, um, as this bullet point shows, is our migration to a new EMR platform, which will take us several years, but we'll get there. And that's the Epic um, platform, which we think will play a major um, benefit with our integration and also providing community services and continue to expand our telehealth, which we're one of the most wired hospitals in, in the state for telehealth services. I think we have close to a dozen applications right now. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> we need to be financially solid. We need to be, we need to be sustainable. And our Thrive program is all about how we transform our health system, right sizing, how big we should be, and making sure we create the right innovation for value and, and evolution. And, and it's, it's a program that we have launched um, in the beginning of the year. We're reaching out to all our staff members. We're looking at many initiatives. There's probably, have a, we have at least probably now a, close to a dozen major task forces looking at how we can reduce our expenses and making sure that we're providing services that will allow our community members to stay close to home here. And this, this is not a one and done. This Thrive will go on forever here. It's, it's how we can, you know, become um, as cost effective as possible, but as high, the high um, quality of care in terms of what we, we render to our patients. So it's, it's not a program, I guess, it's really more of a culture that we're trying to focus on. And, and I think, you know, we're, we're making progress, but we have a long way to go. And I think we have many opportunities. Next slide. Oh, I think that may be Okay, so, um, and this is just some of the um, results to date with our, our Thrive. Um, you know, we've, we're trying to increase our access and, and we're making strides there, but we have a long way to go. I mean, on any given day, we have probably close to uh, 12, 12, 1300 patients waiting to get in for, for services and care. That's much too high. And, and we have teams working on this, uh, how we can increase our access for patients Again, um, as we strive to become a regional referral hospital, uh, we're doing a, a tremendous amount of work on 340B. A lot of that is with the Dartmouth um, Hitchcock team. They have a, a deep bench of people who work on this. Uh, we do not, to be honest. Uh, and I think with their help, we can continue to make sure that we remain eligible as a 340B provider and, and provide services through the 340B program that we could not provide on our own. And uh, you know, a great example is our telemedicine program. We're spending over a million dollars a year in telemedicine. We're not getting any reimbursement for it. But we think that's that's the right type of service to provide to our community. And we think it's vital. And other services such as our, our, our transitional care nursing, which, is, which has received national uh, reviews on it. It's been named a, a national best practice by the, uh, uh, the American Nursing Association magnet program. 
those are the type of investments we're making through our 340B <laughs> program to reach out and provide services to our community. And we're moving down the road of providing mental health, behavioral health services, which we know will not help us financially, but there's a need for it. So our board is making that commitment for us to, is to migrate into those services and we'll be coming forth to the Green Mountain Care Board in the future for some of those services to ask for your approval. And then we're focused on major uh, expense initiatives, trying to become as, um, you know, as a benchmark hospital in terms of not only our quality of care, but our, our costs and our expenses. And, and we're, making, um, we're making improvements in our, in our Thrive program, as you can see here, by reducing overtime and uh, administrative FTE reductions and, and um, discretionary spending, all things that we think we, we have room for improvement and we're, we're, we're making those happen and we're putting them into our, our budget for 2025. So um, <clears throat> that's just a, a, a primer in terms of some key initiatives. I'm now gonna pass over to, uh, to uh, Bob Lava our CFO is going to go into the details on our on our budget operations and um, and how we think we're trying to meet the, the Green Mountain Care Board benchmarks as we go forward. So, Bob, I pass it to you. Great, thanks, Tom. Good morning, everybody. Just want to do a real quick introduction since since I'm uh, a new face to the to the crowd. As Tom mentioned, I'm coming uh, coming to southwestern Vermont from upstate New York where I uh, was the CFO of a hospital in the Adirondack Park, which has uh, very similar challenges to, uh, to, to the Vermont operating environment with the, uh, the lack of growth of, of population, with the aging population, all very, very similar to what, uh, to what we're facing here. You know, I have a strong, I have strong history ties to the state of Vermont. Uh, my, my wife's family's from Vermont, my son is uh, in a couple of weeks, going to be going to UVM for his starting his sophomore year of college. So uh, the success of of healthcare and the state of Vermont is is, is deeply personal to me, and uh, you know presenting this budget uh, with that in mind. So we're going to start with uh, our 2025 budget. Uh, quick and executive summary. As an executive summary, we really developed this budget with five uh, guiding principles uh, in mind. Everything that we discussed to add to the budget, we uh, ran by these five principles to make sure that it fit in with what we were trying to achieve. The first principle of staying, uh, staying as close to the guidelines as uh, set by the Green Mountain Care Board, we take affordability and sustainability uh, very seriously and want to make sure that we are able to you know, provide the services that we, uh, that we need to for the, for the community, but also uh, uh, maximize the affordability, improve operating performance. You know, we, as Tom mentioned earlier, we've had a, a long history of, uh, of a strong operating margin uh, post pandemic that has been challenged with the new operating environment that uh, many hospitals uh, around the country, especially rural facilities are, are going. So uh, doing a, a, a preparing a budget that is financially uh, affordable, but also improving operational uh, performance is, is key. Increasing access to care, uh, as, as Tom and Trey both mentioned, we need to uh, have the care provided to the, the residents close to home. This uh, not only is good for the patient, but is very good financially for, for the state. Enhancing the value of care for our patients, you know, this is uh, you know, better outcomes at a lower cost. So this is, you know, with the goals of increasing access, uh, higher quality at a lower cost are, are, are central to our uh, number four guiding principle. You know, these, achieving these three things is not easy. Often these uh, three things uh, work uh, against each other. So this is a, a challenge that we are facing and are, uh, are working forward. And as, as Tom mentioned, we're also continuing the Dartmouth Health Integration as an, uh, the sixth member hospital, uh, which we feel uh, will offer uh, significant uh, improvements financially as well as clinically for our patients. As we develop the budget, three main themes uh, emerged. The first is improving access 
to uh, re improve access for the patients and reducing the out-migration of those patients to other uh, facilities out of state. Integration, uh, which is a multi-year process. Uh, 2025 in the budget is a, is a transitional year. There are no uh, major uh, material changes to uh, our services offered. Finally, financial recovery. We're going to continue the work of the Thrive Plan which currently we project our fiscal 2024 operations to be about a 1% operating margin and expand upon that for our fiscal 2025 budget to be about a 1.6%. Next slide is a graph, the graphic representation of our last 11 years and how we uh, have, have, have that history of, of a strong financial performance in 2022 and 2023 as a result of you know, coming out of the pandemic, uh, a little blip in, in the performance, but to have turned that around in 2024 and are uh, setting the stage for what 2025 will bring. As a summary of our, of our financials, our 2025 budget, net patient service revenue at about uh, $210.5 million. This is a 3.5% increase over our approved 2024 budget. We're going to go into a little bit of details later on the breakdown of that. Um, the oper other operating revenues, this is uh, uh, about a $4.7 million uh, increase over the projected. Uh, this is a, a pretty significant area of focus for us. Uh, the major uh, item there is, is the 340B uh, program, which we'll, which we'll talk about. Finally, operating expenses. We just want to point out here that we are holding our total operating expense growth to uh, less than 5% uh, as compared to our, our last year budget. So uh, bringing our bottom line to about a $3.6 million operating margin or about 1.6%. Every budget as they're prepared, there's always risks and opportunities with the assumptions. Uh, go through some of these uh, top risks. First is the 340B drug program. You know, this is, uh, you know, the statutory intent of this program is to enable covered entities to stretch scarce federal resources as far as possible, you know, reaching more eligible patients and providing more comprehensive services. That's exactly what we're using 100% of the savings that we realize through this program. As Tom mentioned, every facility is not automatically eligible for this. Eligible facilities need to meet uh, uh, a, a certain amounts of, of patients that they that they care for, uh, and in the that are covered under Medicaid as well as um, uh, SSI benefits under the Medicare program. So it's this program is designed for for hospitals that are caring for the most vulnerable population that uh, in order to increase access to services for that. It's listed as a risk because every, you know, every year when we file our cost report and looking at the percentages that we have uh, in order to, to, to make, to, in order to maintain eligibility in the program, uh, it, it is always a risk that we'll be staying in the program or not. Uh, wage index, uh, reclass. So this is this is another risk that we are doing. Wage index is, is part of our Medicare uh, uh, rate calculation. Uh, as uh, it was presented yesterday, this is uh, one of the major reasons why we took a couple extra days to re really review our our budget and resubmit a, 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 re a, a redesigned budget. We are continually watching our wage index and, and how that uh, affects us and, and uh, anticipate uh, reclassifying next year when we're able to. Staffing is also a risk. Uh, as as you, you'll, you'll see, we have uh, no uh, RN travelers, but uh, staffing, it always remains a risk of what's going on in other areas of the state, as well as in the capital region, which is our, our main competitors for staffing. Finally, financial assistance, as we uh, work the changes through the laws, uh, the changes for financial assistance, we're um, watching how that uh, will financially impact us uh, as an institution. On the opportunity side, you know, revenue cycle opportunities and improvements are always there. 
we're just making sure that our documentation matches the great work that the clinicians do so that we get credit for all of the work that, you know, that they put in for the patients, as well as shared services with Dartmouth Health, looking for expense savings and then clinical uh, improvements. Quickly summary on the, the 2025 benchmarks, the Green Mountain Care benchmark of 3.5% net patient service revenue growth, uh, SBMC's budget meets that uh, benchmark. Benchmark set on commercial rate growth of 3.4%. SBMC's submitted budget is slightly above that at 3.8%. Just wanna make sure that that point out that that is with a 5.4% uh, charge master increase on about 70% of our charges. So that is what is needed in order to get to that 3.8% uh, commercial rate growth. Finally, our operating margin of 1.6% is uh, within the benchmark set of greater than 0%. Net patient service revenue growth, uh, again, within the benchmark, about 3.5%, which is, represents about $7.1 million for SVMC next fiscal year. That's made up of volume increases, uh, commercial price increase, uh, a modest Medicare increase, and then uh, an expected increase in both bad debt and financial assistance. Our operating margin, once again, is over, uh, over zero. So it's 1.6% or $3.6 million. As I mentioned, this is a, 2025 is a continuation budget as uh, our integration uh, as a member hospital with Dartmouth evolves. There aren't any material changes in the services that we're offering. And we're going to continue to work to uh, make sure we find every efficiency and create financial improvement as we can. You know, we do feel that uh, a 3% operating margin uh, is required in order to be sustainable. You know, we need to be able to reinvest in our property plan and equipment, invest in our IT resources so that we can transform uh, the, the way that we deliver healthcare. We also need to uh, reinvest in staff and providers. Can't do this with, without an operating margin. You know, we're not alone in this feeling. You know, I recently read an article published by Deloitte uh, about, about margin and where they really emphasized where without margin, their, uh, the, the ability to uh, fulfill your mission is, is eliminated. In order to, to, to operate, you need to have a margin in order to be able to reinvest in the facility. They, they also mentioned how transformation takes even more margin in order to be able to take the risks and be able to uh, transform, uh, transform the system. The one benchmark that SVMC's budget is slightly, uh, slightly higher is our commercial rate growth. So we're gonna take a little time here to talk about that and what SVMC is doing in order to limit the growth. As I mentioned, the charge master increase of 5.4% on about 70% of our charges is what brings brings us to that 3.8%. You know, we are not increasing our charges on our professional fees. Uh, we are keeping those at the current level. That is the majority of that 30% that we're not increasing. You know, this, we feel that this really supports the, and it works in alignment with our population health strategy in order to get more people into primary care, seeing that healthier community and, you know, eventually uh, bringing less costs. That's, that, that's the theory anyway, the healthcare theory. So, uh, you know, changing patient behaviors is, is an also a, a key part of that, but, you know, working, working uh, on that. SBMC is a low cost provider. You know, so that also provides us less opportunity to, uh, you know, to cut expenses out, uh, out of this uh, increasing, uh, at the same time as we're increasing access to care. I'm going to uh, skip to a, a slide, you know, from the Bartholomew Nash report that was presented to the Green Mountain Care Board yesterday. You know, I think that this just helps uh, identify how SVMC is a low-cost provider when compared with our peers. You can see that the SVMC's uh, amount, when compared to the peers, for price is pretty much right on on the line, and as a cost, we're in the crosshairs. We are not an outlier uh, when compared to our peers on both price and cost. 
So what is, what is SBMC doing to limit this commercial rate growth? Uh, first, we're reducing our total administrative expenses. When looking at our administrative expenses as a percentage of uh, total expense, we're decreasing by about just under 1%, about 0.7% compared to our approved 2024 budget. This is a reduction in our um, IT costs. Uh, we are uh, reducing some administrative salaries, which is bringing about 600,000 less expense in this budget, and also uh, reducing uh, some of our uh, marketing costs. Administrative costs you know, that we are, are capturing in this are billing, transcription, HR, uh, financial services, insurances, and, and other non-clinical services. I'm going to pass it um, over to Tom to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the investments that we're making in our workforce and the culture that we're also uh, installing. Thanks, Bob. Um, and, and certainly, um, again, I, I know we, we are very proud and fortunate to have our, our clinical workforce here at SFMC, both the Certainly, to our our physicians, our providers, our nurses, our other team members, um, and we're and we're trying to build pipelines here, and uh, and we've had support from the state to do that, um, is, which is, is is tremendous. Our our chief nursing officer, uh, Dr. Um, Pam Duchesne, has been our leader here, and. Um, <clears throat> And, and certainly, you know, um, I know people ask me all the time, well, how are you, how are you guys getting by without travelers and nursing? And, and, and I'll, my answer, it's not easy. It's, 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 a, it's a very challenging process uh, led by our nursing leadership team who, who um, do things that oftentimes aren't being done elsewhere. I mean, they, they, they work the floors when necessary. You know, Pam is, you'll see her on all different shifts um, being out there um, we have a tremendous uh, model of self-governance here with our nursing team in terms of how they, where they help to dictate the, the environment they're working in, um, in different systems and approval of policies and, and protocols. So um, <clears throat> this, and yeah, again, we try to recognize our, our staff and, um, and, when, and, we're, and we need to actually pay more. I mean, I, I wish we, I wish we were we had a higher pay scale, and it's something that we're striving to do for our our clinical and our non-clinical teams here. But um, again, there's no there's no secret uh, silver bullet here. This is a lot of hard work. There's a lot of dedication, and we have an engaged staff. We just did a, a, a you know a press gaining survey, and our the engagement level here at SVMC is very high, and it's really because I think uh, we have a tremendous team of leaders who work. With our employees and work closely to focus on the patients and this is a patient-centered model here um our it's all about the patients here and um and so i, I think it's something which um we're going to continue to focus hard keep that culture here in place and but realize that um uh, it doesn't happen easily and there's also limitations on what you can do in this in, in this environment and um and we're working together to continue to keep our our costs at a level which is more affordable, but also realizing that uh, we need to do better, and we're striving to do that. Great. I'll pass it over to Trey to uh, talk a little bit about our expanding access to care. Great. And you know, these are just some examples here. Um, you know, the first is in, in our new emergency department, we did create this, it's a five bed um, unit for those uh, patients that are suffering with a true crisis in mental health. And, you know, I think a lot of places have, have built uh, similar facilities. You know, we had the, um, since we were building a new, new emergency department, we did it with modern technology, modern amenities. But, you know, look, it, uh, beds are just beds. Really, it's how do you support the patients during these stays, which everyone is aware can be from several hours to several days. So what we have is we've actually staffed it appropriately. Um, that costs money, but it is also, of course, the right thing for patients. We have an activities coordinator uh, throughout the day who helps make sure that, that those patients that are able 
um, are getting you know, outside walks, are getting um, exercise within the facility, and have access to books and other, um, other things to do while they are awaiting uh, placement in an inpatient psychiatric unit, if that is determined to be the best location for them. But then there's also the treatment component. So many places, I believe, have these nice holding areas, I'll call them, but no treatment occurs. And so that's really not in a patient's best interest. I can't imagine one of my own family members with a broken leg just hanging out and waiting for days with no treatment to that broken leg, even if they needed to be somewhere else um, for the definitive uh, care. And it's the same is true in mental health. So, you know, our designated agency, uh, which is called United Counseling Services, um, very close with uh, our organization. We're, we work hand in hand. They round every day on the patients, uh, help our emergency physicians in providing, you know, both medical but also uh, other treatment for these patients while they are awaiting uh, inpatient psychiatric transfer. Um, we are expanding uh, and formalizing an alcohol detox program, and let me just explain that uh, because I know a lot of people uh, aren't aware of what this means. Um, unless they've actually gone through it themselves or had family members or close uh, close uh, friends go through such a program. Uh, sometimes when people uh, are alcoholics or, or have a trouble with drinking, they actually need an inpatient medical unit rather than going straight to a inpatient or outpatient rehab. That's not really the case with other substances, but with alcohol, there is a danger of harm uh, when you go through the withdrawal process, delirium tremens, as, as many of you know. So many uh, hospitals will admit patients like that, but it's kind of ad hoc, depends on you know who's working that day and, and other circumstances. Uh, so we're really working to formalize this program where patients that present, if they meet those criteria and they need the inpatient services, that we provide those to them. And again, a formalized, protocolized way that um, incorporates standard of care and best practices. Now, the next step is where someone goes after their two to three days of inpatient, um, and that we are working with community partners uh, to ensure you know, access to those, whether that is an inpatient rehab facility or um, an intensive outpatient place uh, or outpatient at home, but with services during the day. Um, we mentioned the family medicine residency, again, years away, but the planning starts now. Just for everyone's awareness, that's probably about a, a program that basically has four to six residents per year. So three years for family medicine uh, is about 12 residents. Uh, providing care, you know, these are individuals who become primary care physicians right then uh, for their patients. And then uh, once they graduate, the patient then sees the next person coming up. That would be tremendous service in itself for access here in our community. And then of course, once they graduate, if they stay in the area and practice medicine. Um, and then finally, I mentioned um, expanding our primary care site. Uh, so that we can have teams of physicians and advanced practice providers uh, taking care of patients. And let me just emphasize that again so that everyone understands, you know, I think a buzzword or a buzz phrase is we want everyone practicing at the top of their license, right? You've heard that. We should all practice at the top of our license. But frankly, just getting a license is, is no longer what's necessary. The amount of experience that um, people get, especially since the pandemic, in real clinical care is limited. And they come out and they know that and they tell us. And if we can't support them in providing that oversight, then we lose them quickly or they go to bigger cities where they can find these um, areas where they have the, the ability to gain more clinical experience. We can do that. We can provide that oversight. We just have to restructure and develop teams of physicians and advanced practice providers. You know, Typically, a one-to-one -one model or even a one-to-two model um, will expand access for the community. It helps these individuals gain that experience so they can practice uh, more and more on their own. I did want to go back up real quick on the partnering with United Counseling Services. Uh, some of you are aware of the program that's a psychiatric urgent care. Um, it's, it's gotten a lot of acclaim in this area. In fact, the Wall Street Journal covered this. It's called PUC for short, Psychiatric Urgent Care for Kids. It's where kids can go, you know, taken by the police, taken by their parents, if they're in crisis, but not end up in an emergency department. This is a facility that's uh, owned by um, SVMC, uh, but is staffed and operated by the designated agency, not a counseling services. It's incredibly successful. Uh, kids can go here right from school, right from their crisis area, 
not have to go to an emergency department and receive the type of healing that they need. Thanks. Go on back to Bob. Great. Thanks, Trey. Finally, you know, our, our, our fourth our fourth strategy for limiting commercial rate growth is our shared services with Dartmouth Health to reduce costs. Where appropriate, we're shifting administrative functions uh, from the local level to uh, um, um, the more broader system level. We're also expanding our group purchasing opportunities by accessing contracts under the Dartmouth Health name. This budget alone has uh, well over a million dollars of savings uh, attributed to uh, surgical implants. Uh, lab supplies, and those are the, the the same supplies that we purchased last year. We're just going to be able to access better pricing and save uh, expense. Also, working through all of the different contracts that we have, as well as uh, the negotiating uh, ability. Finally, our pharmacy and 340B opportunities. There is a, a a very strong team at the Dartmouth Health System level which is uh, helping us uh, maximize our programs so that we can take those savings and reinvest that 100% of those savings back into the services at SVMC. Go into some of the, some of the details. I'm gonna try to keep it at a, a relatively high level. You have all of the details uh, in our submitted materials, but uh, you know, just, just to emphasize that this budget uh, doesn't have any uh, material changes from our our 24 budget and our or our projected uh, 24 results. Uh, our inpatient volumes are, are expected to about a 5% increase over our 2024 budget and uh, exactly the same as where we're projecting for this year. So no additional growth uh, from where we currently are on the inpatient business. On our outpatient volume, it's a little bit different uh, per area. Uh, these are our uh, main areas that we're focusing on in this budget. Again, not materially changing from either our fiscal 2024 budget or our 24 uh, projected actuals. Assumptions to our largest variances in our budget uh, of 2025 compared to 2024 versus the other operating revenue. The major uh, variance in this is our additional uh, 340B contract pharmacy savings that we're, that we're uh, able to unlock as a partner, as a member hospital of the Dartmouth Health System. Those uh, additional savings do come with expense, which I'm going to jump, jump down to the bottom bullet, is uh, recorded in our pharmacy drug expense. As you'll see on our, our P&L, that is a, uh, one of the largest expense uh, growth areas on our on our uh, financial statements, and it is mostly uh, due to the additional savings that we are re uh, receiving in our contract pharmacies. Also, in, uh, jumping back up to other operating revenue, uh, one of uh, a, a grant that we have received for our nursing pipeline, uh, we are recording 1.2 million in revenue for that grant. There is 100% offsetting expense for that. So an additional 1.2 million in expense added as well. And finally, our locum expense uh, for our physicians, we are uh, keeping that projection uh, very consistent with where we are running in fiscal 2024. Our, our, our fiscal 2024 budget assumptions uh, were to uh, reduce that locums, which uh, we weren't 100% uh, able to achieve. So so we're, but we are not increasing, uh, expecting to increase locums more than what we're currently running. Days cash on hand, you know, currently have about 175 days cash on hand. This is uh, including all of our investments that are held. Most of our investments are held at our, our parent organization, SVHC. Uh, so they're uh, not visible on the, uh, you know, on the SVMC financials, but we are uh, projecting an increase in our total days cash on hand. Uh, this is all uh, related to our assumption on uh, market performance, and we have a 4.5% uh, return assumption uh, built into the budget. You know, our goal for our days cash on hand for our operating, which we're currently projecting to be around six, 
is, is 30. So this is where we're focusing on our financial improvement and uh, in order to uh, boost that up to uh, 30 days that we have you know, one month's worth of expenses um, on hand uh, in the bank. Capital and debt. So this budget uh, represents a $9 million uh, routine capital budget. Most of that capital budget is going to be allocated to the information technology bucket. As we move towards the EPIC integration, it's a multi-year process. This is uh, the preliminary steps needed in order to uh, get our systems uh, ready to uh, ready to go in order to start that process. 2.4 million, uh, which is mostly uh, uh, replacements of our clinical equipment. 1.1 million in our facilities and engineering. Uh, we do have uh, a, a relatively old uh, uh, plant that we are working in. So $1.1 million uh, will be allocated to uh, the ongoing maintenance for that. We also included about a 9% contingency uh, in order to account for the things that are, you know, may, may pop up that we're not uh, fully anticipating. I also want to point out we are anticipating no additional debt uh, being taken out in 2025. We are planning on using uh, both philanthropy as well as uh, equity uh, savings for uh, financing all of this capital. Finally, I just want to run through some of our, our CON projects uh, over the net that we are anticipating over the next uh, couple of years. First is our adolescent psych unit. This CON was filed uh, last February. We're currently working through the process, answering the questions. This is a $9.5 million capital project that uh, is uh, mostly funded uh, by the governor's state budget and then as well as additional equity uh, provided by SVMC. Expansion of our cancer center. We're expecting to file this in the fall of 2024. We're currently uh, wrapping, the, wrapping the bow up on the business plan as well as the fundraising efforts. We're anticipating this to be a $21 million capital project, uh, again, funded 100% uh, through philanthropy and equity from SVMC. And finally, our electronic health record replacement, we're expecting to file this CON in, in fiscal 2026, multi-million dollar project uh, to switch from our, our legacy system over to the, the EPIC uh, system. And uh, most of the funding of this will be paid by the system, Dartmouth Health. So in closing, this budget that we're presenting, uh, we are uh, you know, confident that we're going to be able to maintain and increase access for Vermonters while maintaining uh, affordability and sustainability for the hospital. Uh, and uh, just want to throw it over to Tom and Trey if there's any, any closing remarks you want to make uh, before we open it up to questions. No, I, thank you, Bob. And um, so certainly not. I think we'll just answer your, your questions you may have. Thank you. Sure, and I just had a couple of things. Um, you know, I the the budget um, we worked really hard on. I, I look forward to the other initiatives with the Green Mountain Care Board, AHS, Vermont Medical Society, uh, VAS. I think there's other ways that we can really support these hospital budgets to reduce cost. You know, and I'll just name some of them. Um, and, and you know, these are going to people that practice medicine can really relate to these. You know, we we have to support our doctors and our advanced practice providers in in resource utilization you know what we can do today is so much greater than what we could do 10 and 20 years ago and we feel pressured to do those things when sometimes we know that the benefits aren't there uh, but the societal expectations are and that really does increase costs um, there needs to be a focus on end of life care and how we can preempt some of the um, extraneous costs that are associated when the when the patient themselves wouldn't necessarily want those with the proper discussions ahead of time. And that takes support of primary care. It takes time, uh, but it's but it's worth it. Um, and then critical care times, the same. The stuff that goes on in critical care, often uh, the patient wouldn't want it, but there's nothing there to say uh, uh, anything different. And so a lot of dollars go to critical care that really don't benefit the patients. And then finally, complexity is a great enemy in medicine. The amount of things just looking at oncology, the complexity is so great that we lose a lot of um, appropriate care and cost 
do that complexity and how we work together and not point fingers uh, at different areas in order to to get that under control. So I think those are real things we can work on and um, and and help reduce costs in Vermont. Yeah, um, Chairman Foster, I just want to add one other thing. Um, is you know on a, on a closing comment here is that this is not an excessive budget. I mean, I, I struggle long and hard about coming in with a uh, a one percent, one point six percent margin, which is less than what we need, but we continue to focus on a, a transitional plan to get back to where we have to be in the not distant future. Um, this is this is a budget that um, we're doing without in many areas. So I, I just want the, the the board to know that um, we're 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 trying to stay within. You know guidelines, but also meet community needs, and and, and we have a we have a, a strong tradition here. I mean, the hospital was named the American Hospital Association uh, Rural Hospital of the Year a, a few years ago in the area of community involvement, community collaboration, and we take that very serious. So um, this is this is a challenging budget for us. It, it will continue to be a transitional budget, um, and our, our our focus is to meet community need. But also to maintain financial sustainability and stability, and that's what we're striving for. But we also realize that we're we're not going to be able to catch up in one year. So um, again, we thank you for your time and attention here, and your your support, and and we look forward to working with you. And as as Dr. Dobson said, other other state agencies as we continue to try to transform our healthcare system uh, to a different model. So thank you. Thank you all for your presentation and your comments. Um, I'll turn to member Lunge in, in the event that she has any questions. Thanks. Um, thanks so much and thank you for your sure. presentation today. Can we, can we, can we uh, just take down this, the screen here? Um, sure. Yeah. That's fine. I can let you know if uh, I need you to pull up a slide or something. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to just to ask for a little bit more clarification around the commercial rate request change. So based on what you said today, and I apologize if this was somewhere in the written materials and I missed it, but um, it sounds like you made a request from Medicare to reclassify your wage index um, and that was not accepted. Is that right? Not not entirely correct. We okay. uh, that it's just a, the change in the the wage index of the region that we are are currently in. Yeah, we, uh, we're not able to reclassify out and uh, into a into a higher uh, wage area. And Got it. we were working on that through the first uh, round of the budget, where we assumed we would be able to. Okay. And when when do you when do you would you typically ask for that from Medicare? Yeah. So, so typically this is a, a every three years. So we will be filing our uh, wage uh, reclass for uh, fiscal 2026 uh, soon. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks for that clarity. Um, and so it sounds like in your budget, you had assumed that you might be able to get that reclassification sooner. Correct. Okay, great. Um, so in terms of, um, I'm trying to track it throughout your submission, you you highlight, which I thought was extremely helpful, some of the areas that you're focused on for uh, reducing expenses. Um, and it was helpful to see your slides today that uh, summarized some of those. For example, your reduction in admin expenses connected to reducing IT costs, admin salary and FTT, TE reduction in lobbying and marketing. Um, I just wanted to run through also some of the savings that you articulated in the narrative to make sure that I'm tracking those into the right category. Um, so it sounds like you're expecting some efficiencies also from the affiliation with Dartmouth. Um, and I saw in your narrative that um, you had identified 500,000 for supply chain and purchasing. Does that sound correct? Correct. So there, 
the, the five is about 500 to a million dollars in the, uh, the the total uh, supply chain purchasing area um, made up mostly of the, the supply implants as well as uh, purchasing of lab supplies okay and then there I also thought I noted um, at one point you indicated there was some prescription drug uh, savings. The, right, the prescription drugs are mostly on the the, the 340B uh, related to the 340B program. So yep. in the 340B program, it's all all outpatients. So that's no no drugs used on the on inpatients. So okay, uh, that's purely on our outpatient business. Okay, great. Um, I'm just looking at my notes here. Can I? Okay, great. All right. And then I see the other 600K is on your slide that I had noted from the amendment. Did I miss anything? That wasn't on your slide um, uh, 24. I, I don't believe you missed anything. I think it's just important to know that we are, you know, we're, we're constantly looking at our our administrative costs and trying to be more efficient and, you know, you utilize the, the limited resources that we have to make sure that we are, are fully aligned with providing high quality care at the lowest cost. Great. Thank you. Um, so in your narrative and in your presentation today, you've spoken a lot about how you're trying to reduce transfers through your affiliation with Dartmouth, telehealth, a number of different initiatives. Do you have any way uh, that you document that? How are you going to know that you're successful? Trey, do you want to take that? Yeah, we actually track, uh, Robin, all of the um, calls that come in for inpatient transfers, in other words, to SVMC. Yep. And then, and that's how I came up with the number of about a third, you know, that we're able to actually accept. You know, we wish it was higher than that, um, but that those, you know, we get calls for people that need stuff like cardiothoracic surgery. And, you know, unfortunately we can't do that, but we yep. definitely receive calls for everything from community acquired pneumonia, where uh, one hospital just doesn't have the staff to take care of them to mm -hmm. um, something more complicated where we actually have that service available like urology. So we keep that, it's an internal document. I mean, you know, we share among ourselves, but there's no real external sharing of it, but be happy to grab those numbers for, for you. I, I don't wanna say what they are right now because I just can't remember them off the top of my head. I no remember worries. the percentage. Okay, yeah, no, that's helpful. Um, so it sounds like in a, you are trying to create yourself as a referral center. So bring in folks from outside of the region. You're trying to maintain care locally, so also preventing transfers out. Um, do you have a way that you're able to um, kind of track migration of local patients? Um, I will note that, uh, well, let me ask you the question and then I'll. So do you have a way that you can get a sense of out migration from your region? Uh, we we can, Robin. It, it tends to be a look back, though, so it's yeah. not so it's not you know real time concurrently. But but yeah, we have we have um, different software applications that we utilize firms that we can track our out migration, and we're doing that right now. Okay. Yep. And where do you see most of your out migration? Oh, by far, it's the capital region. Yeah. Okay. It does that, depend, that would Robin, make sense in terms of the geography. Yeah, it does I depend mean, it, on the service as well. You know which yeah. service you're talking about. Um, uh, so inpatient uh, acute transfers, as Tom was saying, that's almost all Albany. Vascular is almost all Albany, but there are some individual needs that people go uh, to DHMC or other locations for. Okay. Great. Um, I had a couple questions around um, the border information. So it sounds, so I've looked at your narrative on page 24, and then there's also the um, spreadsheet, which is confidential, so I won't get into the numbers of that spreadsheet. Um, in terms of the uh, expenditures associated with boarding, this question was really just a clarification question. It sounds like in being a, in a, in calculating the um, impact of patient boarding, 
you're able to do that, um, but and also parse out diagnoses. Is am I getting that correctly? For <clears throat> for the boarding patients, I'm trying to get a sense of can you tell why folks are boarding based on your data? Sorry, I didn't ask the question very clearly. I need more coffee, I guess. I can just say a few things to that. Um, it is difficult and manual, um, Robin. If I we see. look at if we look at diagnosis, that just doesn't that just doesn't matter. For example, you know, Dave will know this, but you know, it could list a diagnosis of sore throat, and you're and you're why is this person waiting then for uh, you know boarding? It's because they actually have you know an oral pharyngeal carcinoma that needs uh, an, an otolaryngologist, and we don't have that. Uh, we can say anecdotally, though, it's for all the reasons that you're aware of, and it kind of yeah. varies over time. So it's transport, it's acceptance um, it, in an acute care facility, and it's acceptance at a, a skilled nursing facility. Those are the you know three main reasons. Thank you. Uh, and then my last question about borders was, um, do you have a sense of... Um, the insured status of your of your borders? Like, do you think the payer mix is about the same as your hospital in general? Is it more Medicare patients, more Medicaid patients? Do you have any sense of that? I don't have any sense off the top of my head. We would have to do, you know, again, that manual deep dive uh, to get that. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me just take a quick note, look at my notes to see if I missed anything. Um, Robin, would you like us to get back on that, that question so you have an answer? No, I don't want to cause you manual work. I just I was curious to to know what was easy or difficult to to know about yeah. the boarding situation based on the data. So at this point, please don't yeah. go do a bunch of manual work. <laughs> um, but thank you for asking. Yeah. Nope. Okay, I think I am good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Um, I had just a couple. I'll try not to take too long. Um, on the transfers and trying to keep the care and expand the volume of care at your hospital, do you distinguish between transferring to other hospitals or to community providers? Um. You mean do we keep a, do we keep um, um, a, a log of, of where they exactly they go, uh, Owen? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, I'm, what I'm getting at is part of our healthcare reform goals are to get care out of hospitals right. to local community providers. How do you make sure that when you're keeping more care at the hospital, you're not impacting care being delivered to more community-based pro providers? Yeah, Owen. I, um, oh, you know, I would say. With certainty, 98% of these patients are needing inpatient um, services, not outpatient services that we're doing. Otherwise, we, you know, we would work to find that. Um, and so, back to the border things, there are patients that are in our um, emergency department, and the intent is not for them to go to an inpatient facility, but it is to get care in an outpatient facility. So we don't really include those in the transfer because they are ultimately not transferred to a you know a, a tertiary care type facility but what what we're talking about is for example um you know let's say a patient needs a nephrostomy tube in their kidney uh because they have such bad buildup in in the kidney due to you know a cancer or a kidney stone and if we don't have a urologist to do that then we have to transfer them uh, again usually to the capital district so we're trying to ensure that we we have those services when appropriate. You know, we're never going to have neurosurgical services because that's too rare. Uh, but something like urology, um, that those are available here and that those patients can be supported in our intensive care unit with the use of our own hospitalists, plus our telemedicine intensive care relationship with DHMC, which is now approaching uh, probably eight to 10 years of use, um, six to eight years at least. And that has helped keep patients local rather than transferring them. And, and Owen, I'm not sure if this gets to your question or not, but we did in the last year get certified 
license to offer swing beds through through the federal government. So we now are a swing bed provider. So, you know, then that was driven primarily by the fact that we can't get all these patients in the nursing homes when, when necessary. So at least we can designate them to be a, a nursing home patients within the walls of our acute care setting. And that helps um, to a certain degree, but it doesn't solve the problem. And then um, you testified about uh, SVMC being a, a more affordable hospital than others. And it sounded like you said also that the majority of lost care from your region is going to, to Albany. Right. How do your costs compare to Albany? We're lower. Oh, yeah, I mean, our, primarily the, the hospitals that we refer to are, are Albany Medical Center, um, Samaritan uh, Healthcare, and um, St. Peter's, and we're, we're lower in, in, in all those areas. Now, I wouldn't say on and every what, single diagnosis we'd be lower, but course. when you look at it in a composite way, we're, we're, we're definitely lower. Yeah, no, of course. And what data sources are you looking at to make that cost comparison? You know, I, I have to, I can get to the name of the program. Um, you know, our director of planning, Jim Tremarkey, has been very, delves into that pretty deeply. So we, we can get back with the name of the program. Um, I want to apologize for the informality of our office space. We don't have an office. So um, I just heard my St. Bernard trudge behind me and I noticed you had one in your slides. So I just wanted to. <laughs> it's a long story there. We're, we're, we're not informal by choice. We just don't have a formal office space right now. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, yeah, if you could get me the name of that, I'm curious yeah. what the program is, and we have a number of sources we're looking at, and that would be helpful. Um, the only other question I really had was on um, uh, provider productivity, and in your workbook, you provided um, some benchmarked data in provider productivity. And there's a number of service lines that looked low, 20th, 15th, 25th percentile. Is there um, opportunity to increase the productivity at some of those that are, you know, significantly below the 50th percentile? And is that in the plans? Yes, I can comment on that real quick, Bob, and then maybe you can make a comment. So first off, um, I, I hate to jump on the data, but just for everyone's awareness, this is national data. So if I'm a primary care physician in New York City, it is very different my ability to refer patients to specialists down the street is, it's really lickety split, right? And in Vermont, I don't have that ability, so I am dealing with those. I mean, I'm not a primary care physician, but if I was, I would be dealing with those. I would be making those phone calls. I would be calling and speaking with the specialist. So that impacts um, the number of the, the productivity, which by the way, is just measured, you know, wor relative uh, value units, which is not a great way to measure how effective is a physician or advanced practice provider at providing care. So uh, th that's the data. But yes, there's always opportunities. It's very transparent. We've worked over the past several years to make this data transparent to all of our uh, physicians and advanced practice providers, but more importantly with the office staff, because even though we act like this is the productivity of an individual, that's, you know, that's wrong and actually causes people to be very defensive. It's the productivity of the system in taking care of a population. And that's actually what I meant earlier when I was talking about aligning advanced practice providers who are sort of just coming out of training with an experienced uh, physician or other advanced practice provider to really uh, it, increase the volume of patients we can take care of. There are, of course, people that are very good at their job and people that aren't so great. And so we try to support those individuals as well. And if you're able to increase some of those service lines, what will that, what's the plan to address the, uh, if the, your budget is approved and you are able to make up some increase there, what's the plan to address the overall effect on your Budget order, meaning that that, that our, our revenue will increase because of the the added access. Yeah, I think I, yeah. I I think that you know as we move as we move in this transitional year, you know maintaining this this one point six percent. There's a lot of risk in the budget, uh, so by increasing access, 
sure that that means additional net revenue, but there's there's also a lot of risk. And and in our current models, we're not anticipating that increased access to increase more than what our net patient revenue growth is projected. And Owen, I would just comment, and, and I think this answers your question, it may not. In addition to revenue, of course, there's other metrics. There's the productivity metric we just talked about, which I also mentioned the limitations, but there's days until appointment, those access metrics that actually, uh, you know, your group has defined something specific. We would always follow uh, something similar, but now we're following that directly. Um, as as well as you know, anecdotal information coming from patients themselves and community events we do. So those are all you know pop, compiled together and will help us know you know how effective is our access. And, and by the way, we really didn't get into it. I'm I'm not sure why <laughs> we didn't get into the whole um, description of what we're dealing with here with the insurance companies and their denials, uh, which. If you look at the growth of that is is significant over the last few years and and that's a huge risk for us um that we're very nervous about especially on the the medic you know the medicare advantage programs which are they're you know really kicking the stuffing out of us here so i i think the 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 risk is huge there and um you know could very well offset some of our, our access initiatives that we're trying to uh, work on. In in your long range planning for some of the service lines that are um, low, are there any? Is there any consideration to reducing any service lines? Um, you know, uh, be very honest. We don't we don't do a lot of esoteric service lines. Um, I mean, it's pretty much bread and butter here. Um, Trey, I mean, I, you, you could help me, but I would say, I'd say the answer to that question is no, but I, but we always are looking at, you know, I mean, we, we're going through the Oliver Wyman study and, you know, they, they raised some questions about some low volume areas. So we're certainly looking at those. There's not a lot of them to tell you the truth. I mean, we don't do a great deal, but um, Trey, anything you want to weigh in on this one? Yeah, I mean, there's a few smaller ones. You're right, Tom. There's there's not um, larger ones, at least right now that we've ad identified. Um, one would be we do have a part-time plastic surgeon who does some cosmetics, but you know, really is a small volume and and doesn't really support the practice. And he's retiring soon, and so that won't be replaced, at least in its current you know, mechanism. Uh, the second would be, you know, general surgery volumes have been down across the state and, and also nationally, and um, they didn't rebound like we anticipated. So we've repurposed, which is kind of a strange word to say for a surgeon, but had some of the surgeons focus on other things that were out migrating, like endoscopy. Uh, patients were going elsewhere, so they've stepped in. If they needed additional training, we helped support them uh, and, and making sure that you know, frankly, that that they are working to the level they want to be working, and and that is that is the case. Thank you. And the only other question I had was on the um, I think it was on the thrive. You don't need to bring it up, but the thrive slide. You had a, a amounts of money you were looking to reduce in the interest of um, cost containment, and it had five hundred thousand dollars in overtime, two million on salary adjustments, discretionary, et cetera. Is that where you currently are, or is that the target that you're trying to achieve? Those are our fiscal 2024 targets that we are well on the way of achieving. Gotcha. Okay. And then are there other targets you're planning in this budget, and what are they? So a lot of these targets that we have in 2024, we baked those into the assumptions of our 2025 budgets. But we are continually looking at uh, new initiatives uh, that we will need to, uh, to 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 put into place in order to maintain that one point six percent operating margin. Right. I, I give you one another example. Owen is this? You know the, the whole. I mean, we um, the service contracts. We have we have millions of dollars of service contracts, and yeah, you know, and we. And we hit a target this year of about a five hundred thousand dollar reduction. We think, you know, we're when we're looking at every one of them, and there's literally hundreds of them, to see can we can we renegotiate, can we eliminate, can we change those 
So that's just a, another example that we are going to carry over into 2025 in terms of our, our Thrive initiatives. Okay. If there's any targets you're setting for fiscal year 25 beyond the ones that you've baked into the budget that you've achieved, um, if you could send us an update on what the goals are, um, that'd be really, really helpful. And I appreciate the uh, conversation around efforts to contain costs very much. I have no other questions. If any other board members do, um, please go ahead. Could I, could I just chime in with a few, um, mostly for Dr. Dobson for Trey, um, regarding expansion of some of the specialty services and procedures. So you mentioned vascular and cardiac services and procedures um, today, and I think in the narrative and a presentation down in Bennington recently. What what are some of the cardiac and vascular services and procedures you're looking to expand into? And I, I guess I would also add, you mentioned ERCP services potentially and uh, robotic surgical services and Thanks. All right, let me see if I can answer those. So David, so we're not talking about, you know, big surgeries. These are um, minimally invasive vascular surger surgeries that would not be done, you know, five days a week at SVMC. This is um, a vascular surgeon from DHMC coming down and doing outreach, you know, maybe two to four times a month. Um, along with the clinical outpatient aspect. So, you know, we're going to start off where they come, uh, one or two physicians are already uh, just got medical staff privileges. They'll be down doing an office day and a surgical day a month, and then that'll probably increase to about, like I say, three to four days per month. We anticipate that's the volume that would, um, you know, support our community needs. So, so not a lot, uh, but definitely the numbers there um, suggest that benefit to the patients. There's also, so as far as cardiology, you know, we're not setting up a cath lab, but we are looking at um, uh, this, you know, how we can do some cardiac CT to prevent patients from leaving for catheterization that turns out to be unnecessary. Also some, a little bit more advanced echocardiography that our cardiologist could read and patients go elsewhere for. Same is true for maternal fetal medicine, increasing some of our, um, our technician training and software programs in the ultrasounds so that these patients going for level two ultrasound now, which has somehow become a standard, um, don't have to travel so far for those. Um, let's see, robotics, we already have some robotics that are going on. We know that we uh, have great difficulty recruiting another urologist to join uh, without robotics. It's just how they were trained. You know, that's not necessarily true in other surgical specialties, but definitely urology and some orthopedics. Um, we've incorporated that with um, working with uh, DHMC. In fact, we, you know, we took one of their um, robots that has um, been used. So it's a used machine that's highly functional and, and works here. And the, the other question I was going to ask is I noticed your inpatient pediatric volumes are really, really, really low. Is that something you guys are thinking about continuing or, or, or whatnot, 12 per year? Yeah, so, you know, mostly what's happened there is, 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 I know you brought this up so that I talk about it for awareness for others, is the standards in admitting a, a pediatric patient have, have uh, changed. When I started 20 years ago, I'd probably admit a patient, you know, every week to two. Um, now you just don't admit kids, you treat them in the ED, get them better and send them home, or they end up needing you know, services at a tertiary care center. So that's the trend that we have seen. But of course, we, we have uh, 400 deliveries per year. So the pediatricians are needed for those newborns. And if a, um, you know, a 10 year old comes in that needs an appendectomy and an overnight stay, we will do that. And so we want to maintain or they need to be admitted for, you know, respiratory distress, but, but um, aren't in need of an ICU. We want to continue to admit those patients. Plus, um, we have, you know, the we hope to have an adolescent psychiatric unit here, and there will need to be pediatric medical coverage of that unit. Thanks. Yes, I'll, I'll jump in then. Um, thank you for the presentation. And actually, welcome to Mr. Laba. Uh, you've joined a strong leadership team and a, a very well-respected hospital in our state. So welcome aboard for your first rodeo at the GMCV. Um, 
a couple questions. I do have some questions. One is around the the, the commercial rate increase of the 5.4, and I understand it's distributed 70% of the charge master items and 0% for professional services. I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about uh, you know, how those 70%, is it basically 5.4 on inpatient and 5.4 on outpatient, or how, how are you thinking about um, distributing that 5.4%? The 5.4% is pretty much across the board on all of the services all of that 70% of those services, uh, inpatient and outpatient. Okay. Um, it would be really helpful. I know Chair Foster asked for that data of how you're comparing yourselves to other hospitals. Um, it would be really helpful to understand that. You know, one of the data pieces that we saw yesterday it was the RAND pricing, as I'm sure you're aware. And if, if I just look, do a quick look at the outpatient uh, standardized price, for Southwestern compared to Dartmouth and Albany, it does appear in that, at least that one data source, that the outpatient prices are higher, inpatient maybe lower or lower. So it would be helpful for us to understand how you're comparing your prices to some of these other prices. And um, as you're applying the 5.4% on inpatient and outpatient, does that create an even larger deviation on the outpatient side to your comparator hospitals? So that would be helpful for me to understand uh, if you get as you're following up with that. Um, I, I wanted to also ask some questions about the clinical productivity uh, data that you shared with us. I'm wondering, first of all, if you all, somebody could explain um, the benchmarking. It looked like there were four benchmarks used, four national benchmark used, and it looks like there was a rural adjustment applied already to that to that benchmark. So I'm, I'm hopeful that you can explain a little bit more about how you arrived at the at the benchmark numbers across the four different surveys with a rural adjustment already applied. Bob, do you want to speak to that or you want me to speak to that? Go ahead, Trey. So the way um, Jessica that was arrived at is we used a third party to come in a, a call named Pinnacle to come in and make that recommendation. We could have chosen um, just one like MGMA. There's limitations in doing that and that was their recommendation. Um, it does apply a um, rural change which which affects some of the productivity numbers, but it also affects some of the compensation numbers. Um, and that's kind of you know what the goal was behind that. Also, um, work, you know, being now a member of the of, with DHMC, it was clear that the benchmarking they were using was focused on academics, which is quite different um, when you have residents and and others in there. Um, productivity benchmarks are, are extremely useful and also extremely problematic. Uh, because they vary from uh, service line to service line, as I mentioned earlier, and I'm not trying to make excuses, but what we do is we use this as a model. We adhere to it, uh, but we pay close attention to what's going on. And you know, the goal is to support the the individual provider, but also the practice to ensure that their productivity is appropriate um, for what they are doing. With that in mind, do you have specific clinical productivity goals? by specialty area then? We do. Um, we try to be at the 40th percentile or higher. Um, you know, I let me just give you an example, and I want to be um, careful here that I'm articulate. You know, a productivity measure also includes how much is done for a patient, which is important, but how much is done to a patient. And we want to be careful that productivity numbers don't get in the way of doing what's right for a patient. You know that a lot of these productivity numbers, I'm sure you're aware of this, but um, are affected by additional things done for patients that, that there's no measure in the productivity of whether that was necessary. And so we are, we don't want to be, I don't think any organization wants to be the highest productivity because that's probably implying there are things being done that aren't necessary for a patient. And it's why we don't use productivity metrics in places like the emergency department. Uh, and inpatient services where it's clear that those numbers um, can be driven up by ordering additional um, treatment and diagnostics. Okay. Um, 
I also, it, it seemed as though, I know these are confidential files, so I'm not going to give the numbers, but it seemed as though there were some areas where you were expanding services, hiring more providers um, while the productivity levels were, say, for example, below the 40. Yeah, that's correct. Um, you know, we have um, other initiatives beyond Thrive that have worked to increase those productivity numbers. And again, it's not just the physician so or advanced practice provider. So if we are adding people, it's due to access. Um, so we have to add them anyway, you know, even if productivity is low while we at the same time work on the productivity, which which we are. And, and just to give an example, um, back to the primary care, some of those things are investments in um, and additional blueprint investments, which we are participating in the expansion, and that will help quote the productivity because it, it allows the physician to not be involved with um, long conversations and phone calls that are very important, but also could be done by someone else while the physician then takes on a new patient. So I guess in short, Jessica, it's it's parallel. It's not just hiring new people. It's not just increasing productivity. I think we have to do both to work on the access. Um, and just one final question around along these lines. You'd mentioned the compensation and your third party uh, consultant helping with the consult with the productivity and the compensation. Is there alignment with the compensation and the productivity? So, for example, in practices that are below the 40th percentile in productivity, or is, are there, is there compensation below the 40th percentile? Does how does that work? The alignment yeah. between the two. Right. So, um, so the overall model, the answer to that would be yes. There are certain services where the productivity cannot be, uh, I mean, it, it, there's just not enough volume to support a productivity above 40%, yet there's no way we could have that service and it's critical to the community. So let me just give you an example. Radiation oncology in our practice, you know, you need about five, four to five oncologists, uh, three to four oncologists to support uh, one full-time radiation oncologist. We don't have that here, so our radiation oncology volume is less than that, but it's certainly, you know, definitely needed in the area. Patients would not be able to receive cancer care. So in order to support having that physician, even though the productivity is below 40 percent percentile, um, he is paid at that 40th or 50th. I can't remember. I think he's at the 50th percentile in order to it's keep like him. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, so I mean, in some ways, this speaks to a lot of the Do Dr. Bruce Hamry work, right? In trying right. to think about regional referral centers, centers of excellence, and ensuring there's enough volume to support the the necessary specialists. Yeah, Jessica, um, you know, in that, since you brought it up real quick, you know, the numbers that were listed in some of those initial reports are unrealistic for primary care panels. Four thousand patients. Nobody has metrics like that. And I think Bruce wasn't trying to say, you know, everyone needs to do that. I think what he's trying to say is, look, in order to support the access needs that he predicts in the future, you're going to need a team, uh, you know, surrounding that physician and advanced practice provider to be able to take care of that many patients. And that is doable. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I, I was referring more to his specialty services, centers of excellence in terms of ensuring enough volume to support the numbers of specialty providers, given the call schedules, all the things Yes, um, agree. that are required. Yeah. Um, let me just think if I have other questions here. Um, oh, I, you know, I do have a question and I want to, uh, it's around the quality and I'm, and I'm, you know, I so appreciate it. Southwestern has won tremendous awards over the years. And I think well-earned awards over the years for the quality, for the community engagement, for a lot of, uh, areas of excellence. Um, and I just, you know, we're we're trying to figure out how do we think about quality at the board. I think the public is trying to figure out how do we think about quality. And some of the metrics that are out there are CMS star ratings. They are leapfrog. And I'm just wondering if you can speak to, I know there's been some, you know, reductions in star ratings across the board in Vermont, actually, some reductions in leapfrog ratings across the board in Vermont. And I'm wondering if you can just speak to, how should we interpret these reductions in stars and leapfrog A's, B's, C's? And what information should the public have uh, to assess quality? Trey, do you want to? I'll start and maybe Tom can jump in afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, first off, everyone loves the uh, quality metric source that gives them the highest value and you know then doesn't like the ones 
So if you do well in U.S. News and World Report, that's clearly the best source. Um, so we struggle with that too. I will say I, I believe CMS um, actually incorporates probably the, uh, the the best data source. It's not perfect by any means, and it does vary depending on what um, what uh, services your particular hospital offers. So when I say that, I think it's pretty good for larger community hospitals and larger centers. It may not be as great for smaller centers. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. So I think uh, LeapFrog, same way, I think being open to those. There are some, um, I don't want to say, but there are some others that are, are not really as representative and they just tend to take data from other sources and put them together. And so I think you have to be careful in that way. It's very hard to measure outcomes. Um, so there has to be both the, the objective, but there's a little bit of subjective um, in there as well. I think in Vermont, we can do things like measure access um, and access itself, although it doesn't sound like it's actually a quality because you don't know the outcome. Um, it is true that access correlates with outcomes. So if there is good access, there should be at least a trend towards better outcomes. And that's shown in other countries where they have better access to primary care and therefore, and then they also happen to have better outcomes. So it, it, does Southwest do anything? Are you, do you have any uh, initiatives in place given the recent adjustments in the LeapFrog and in the CMS star ratings? Uh, oh, absolutely. You know, we have a spreadsheet um, that's it's, it's so long, I'm I, trying to get to the end of it, it's impossible, but it has all of the CMS um, measures that SVMC, uh, you know, is applies to, I can't remember, it's like 80 out of 140, something like that, um, ballpark. And where we were last year and where we are this year, what went up, what went down, and how do we focus efforts on, on all of them, of course, but prioritizing the ones that make the most sense, that we feel like we can move, um, and that, you know, frankly matter. There are some that they don't seem to matter as much as, as others, and so we're going to put our efforts, because our resources are limited, of course, uh, towards the ones that, that matter. Okay, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, just a, a couple quick things first. Um, uh, Bob, from a fellow Northern New Yorker, welcome to Vermont. <clears throat> um, we should we should chat sometime about our favorite national park. Um, and to to go along with what Jess said, you you've joined a strong team. Um, I always uh, I've done this my third time. I enjoy um, hearing what's going on at your facility and hearing Tom and Trey. Um, and thank you for the presentation. Um, that was all that I was going to say until um, Trey mentioned a moment ago the um, the link between access and outcomes and how they're related. Um, that's something um, that we haven't gotten deeply into here at the board, but um, the research on that's really strong. And it seems to be that it's a, a signal of system friction. Right? When access is a bad problem, there's a lot of friction in the system, and that friction extends and disrupts um, other quality components. And so I, I appreciate you um, bringing that to us at the board, and I appreciate knowing that you're um, on it. So um, thank you very much for your presentation today. Thank you. Um, anything from the healthcare advocate? Uh, good morning. Yes, so we have a few a few uh, questions. Uh, I'll ask a few questions, and then Sam will have a few questions as well, Mr. Chair. Um, Great. Thank you, Southwest, uh, for the presentation. Appreciate it, and uh, um, uh, we do have. Um, a f uh, I, I will focus on the bad debt and free care and Act One Nineteen issues, and Sam has some broader questions. Um, first, I, I just want to recognize and appreciate Southwest did a very good job of complying with Act 119. Your plain language uh, summary um, is quite good. Your um, uh, your measurement of as uh, your asset uh, residency income measurement are all uh, in line with the law. We have, we have one concern, and I'll bring it up, um, and that is that. Um, uh, and I'll explain it a little bit. Um, uh, income verification, you know, the reason why the law uh, states that people can uh, supply their tax, uh, uh, their their um, previous taxes 
And in the event that they don't file taxes, where their taxes don't represent their income, they can supply uh, uh, other documents is so that um, that people don't face a daunting list of, I don't know, eight different documents they need to produce in order to apply. And uh, so that's one place where I think it makes sense for you to take a look at uh, your application and um, uh, because I think it could have that impact. Um, and I don't think it's in strict compliance with, with the law. Um, but on the whole, I wanted to, I, I really wanted to say, uh, express an appreciation. You are amongst um, sort of the top notch of hospitals that have, have done a good job. Great. Thank you. I appreciate um, that. And we'll take a look at that concern. Um, so the reason why, um, well, I, I guess I want to recognize that in 2023, your bad debt to free care um, is, uh, you know, for every dollar of free care, you had almost three dollars of bad debt. Um, and um, so I, I, I don't really have a question about that. I just want to note it. Um, and um, but I also want to just just at least glance at your 25 budget on those factors, you're you're estimating a fairly significant increase in bad debt in your budget uh, from 6.1 million in 23 to 8.5. And I wonder if there's something going on that you're tracking or how it is that you arrived at. Do you have any insights as to how why that number, you're projecting that number to go up? As as uh, affordability becomes an issue, you know we are anticipating uh, more movement to, uh, to to patient responsibility uh, type plans, higher higher deductibles, higher coinsurance plans, and with that comes uh, an increase in the amount of, of of bad debt and the you know the the ability for the healthcare organizations to to collect that from the patients directly. So that was the main driver for for, for that assumption. Uh, you know there there are others as well, uh, but you know I, you know I appreciate your 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 renewed focus on 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 bad debt charity and, and charity care financial assistance. You know that's financial assistance is something we take very seriously. We have staff you know working with our patients uh, very closely in order to make sure that uh, that they qualify. And in the overwhelming majority of, of patients that up, uh, apply do qualify, and and we work through the process. So. We, we will continue to, to, to look at that. Great. I think um, I appreciate your answer. Um, it's a good one and a concerning one, <laughs> a reasonable one and a concerning one. Yeah, um, I, I think, um, I, you know, I, I don't know what the right ratio is. Um, we often cite, you know, hospitals that achieve a one to one. Um, um, we, you know, I didn't say this up front. I just want to say it really clearly. We, of course, like you, will watch carefully uncompensated care. We don't want uncompensated care to go up. Um, we're hopeful through these efforts and through your efforts that um, that the uh, the bad debt that's out there that would qualify for free care is captured or better captured, and. Um, so um, that's the reason why I'm focusing on the ratio. Um, you know, I, I I mentioned the hospital that achieves a one to one. Um, I don't know that that's the the right number, but I'm uh, I'll just say you know concerned about um, you know a three to one. Um, and 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 I would welcome you know I think uh, you know we need to keep talking about how to do a better job of reaching people. Um, and making sure that they get the support to fill out the the the, um, the applications for free care. Absolutely, and I think you know I think we have you know we have staff on payroll that uh, you know their job is to uh, ensure that patients get free care, and and uh, so this is an expense that we're be bearing in order to reduce our revenue, and you know whether it's classified in bad debt or charity care or financial assistance. That this is this care that we're providing to patients that we're not getting paid for, and you know, as as a hospital, we're required to just to see every patient that walks through our door, whether or not they have insurance or not, and we and we gladly do so. 
and that that's, uh, you know, it, it becomes a problem when we are not reimbursed for those services uh, at any point. But, but with that said, we, uh, you know, we, we take our mission uh, very seriously and, and work to uh, stay within the guidelines and, and meet those regulations set in order to provide care to, uh, to everybody. Thank you. Sam, do you have questions? Yeah, thank you. Good morning. Can folks hear me okay? Great. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Sam Peich um, with the Healthcare Advocate. Um, I wanted to follow up, Mr. D, with something I believe you said. I just want to make sure I heard it correctly. Did you say that you don't get reimbursement for telehealth? And if so, could you elaborate on that a bit more? No, our, our, our telehealth services, by and large, I'm talking primarily our inpatient ser telehealth services, our ICU, our our ED services, um, psychiatric, um, they're, they're non-reimbursable at this point in time. So we, have, we, we contract with Dartmouth-Hitchcock to provide those services, um, and we have, a, we have a contract fee for those because they're incurring expenses, mm -hmm. but uh, they're basically non-reimbursable. Okay. Um, and I know you spoke a bit about 340B revenue and how that was offset by higher expenses. Could you just elaborate on like the higher expense side? Because that was confusing, at least to me. Sure. So there's there's uh, two different uh, factors of the 340B program that Southwestern Vermont uh, t takes advantage of. The first is is the savings on drugs that are used on our outpatient services. So these are uh, drugs that are used in our infusion center uh, predominantly. So we're able to uh, purchase that or because we qualify uh, service servicing a, a high Medicaid population, we're able to qualify for uh, discounts on uh, purchasing. So those are the savings that that we're able to uh, re record. On the other side of the program are is our contract pharmacy program where we're able to contract with uh, pharmacies to uh, fulfill prescriptions on uh, scripts written by uh, our outpatient providers. So if a provider goes and sees one of our, their primary care provider, they write a script that's filled for a 340B eligible drug that they fill at the CVS or any of the, the pharmacies, the local pharmacies that we have a contract with, you know, there is uh, savings to be had there as well. Uh, those savings are, are reduced by the replenishment cost because if, if that pharmacy fills that prescription, we have to pay to refill uh, their inventory of pharmaceutical uh, drugs. So that that was the expense that's offsetting the savings that I was talking about. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate it. Very confusing um, program and much probably much more confusing than what it needs to be. Yeah, yeah no, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, something you said in the narrative, and you don't have to go to this, but just in case you want to cite it um, or look it up, um, it was on page 19. You talked about health insurance premiums for your employees and offering. You basically said you were going to cover and keep the premium at no more than 10% and absorb some of these costs and provide a lot of free care for certain services that employees have. I'm just curious. You said those costs were absorbed, which was interesting to me. I'm wondering if you quantify that in any way and how you arrived at the decision to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you we look at our, so we are a self we are a self insured plan. So the, the you know the services that we're providing to uh, you know to our employees, uh, you know, do have a, a direct cost. You know, if that employee goes to Albany Med, you know, we're paying those you know through through our TPA, we're paying those claims uh, uh, to Albany Med. So you know, as you know, we we have uh, brokers that and and actuaries that we do uh, all the different studies on what our premium equivalent is going to be because we don't have we, we don't have a premium based plan it's a it's a self insured plan so those premium equivalent uh, the premium equivalent expenses were uh, that the actuaries presented were significantly higher than a 10% increase from 24 to 25 based on their based on their models uh, we, we decided to uh, in order to reduce the the burden on our employees to limit that to a 10% increase Okay, thank you. Um, and last question, and this is towards the end of your narrative. You talked about not being able to fully utilize one care waivers due to star ratings of regional skilled nursing facilities. Maybe this is a question for you, Dr. Dobson. I'm, I'm just wondering if this is something that 
Is there anything that SVMC can do about that? Or are there any like regional efforts to improve that? Or is that really out of your control, unfortunately? Well, I, I mean, say definitely we try to partner and help folks, but um, unfortunately it is a little bit out of our control. Um, I know specifically, you know, you're saying things like um, the three day waiver, but it has to be a four or five. And yeah, that is really problematic. Um, you know, we'll try to help folks when, when we can. Um, but our resources are focused here. Certainly dialogue improves um, outcomes if we can just keep talking about it. So Great. definitely the patient Thank the you. patients suffer. I mean, because they're just in the wrong place, right? So yeah. it, it's good to focus on. Hey, Mike, go ahead. Uh, if I could just jump back in, uh, Mr. D, I, I'm, I'm confused. I don't doubt you one bit, but I'm confused by the inability to to bill for uh, telehealth, given all of the ongoing conversation uh, in the legislature about expanding coverage and, and reimbursement for telehealth. And we don't need to go into it more here, but it uh, it, it just is confusing to me and maybe warrant some follow-up. Yeah, Mike, I can Mike, just explain Mike, real quick. Mike, what I'm really referring to is the inpatient telehealth services, which are expensive. It's, um, I, I mean, there's some, there's some, there's um, some, some insurers cover for outpatient at a much lower rate, but it's inpatient, which is the, really the major piece of our telehealth program. It's it's all part tied into our rate, so we don't we don't get separate re separate, separate reimbursement for it. And it's very expensive. I mean, it's, I mean, it's a great service, and we 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 support it, and we're making investments, but it's it doesn't come free. Thanks. Yeah, that's everything for me too. Thank you. Great. Um, I, uh, we have nothing else and we appreciate your time this morning and we will adjourn and go off the record till we start back up with um, the Copley presentation at 1215.